Welcome back to History Chatter. In the last episode, I was talking about the fate of Hindustani, and I said that uh, it had profound repercussions on modern Indian history and politics. Finally, leading to the partition of India and making of the three subcontinental nation states of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Today, we move to even more contemporary politics. I have. two guests with me my professor professor sudha pai of jnu and uh, my colleague and contemporary dr sajjan kumar who were together with me in jnu professor pai has been a professor for last 40 years she retired shortly before a few years from jnu she's been an acknowledged global expert on legislative politics development communalism and dalit politics in india she's written and edited several books but professor pai and dr kumar have been collaborating for last two book projects the first one everyday communalisms which came out in 2018 and now their recent book on which will be uh, talking in a good much detail which is the new uh, maya modi azad dalit politics in the time of hindutva um dr sajjan kumar is a political scientist who also passed out from jnu he prefers agrarian studies election studies indian politics and political theory but more than that he's been a sophologist um and he carries out election studies in great detail in recent years he has also coined this theory of subaltern hindutva which has been much in circulation and debate uh, professor pai dr kumar thank you very much for joining me in this discussion first i ask both of you separately professor pai first and dr kumar after that why did you choose to write this book Maya Modi Azad politics in the time of Dalit politics in the time of Hindutva now do you foresee did you see a significant point of departure in Dalit politics in UP and in India at the moment professor pai first well a lot has been written on dalit politics in the 1990s and there has been a big change where the 2000s are concerned So in our book we wanted to explore why these changes have taken place and uh, we actually looked at three aspects where the present day crisis of dalit politics is very clearly reflected one is the decline of the bsp which at one time was a very strong party that drove identity politics shaped national politics also second with its decline we find that a large subsection of dalits have moved towards the bjp particularly after you know the rise of narendra modi and the coming up of what you have just described as subaltern hindutva and third there is fragmentation of dalit politics in north india today you have the rise of new leaders like chandrashekhar azad who are separate from the bsp and who represent a younger generation so we felt that there is today fragmentation of dalit politics unlike the 1990s in terms of sub caste in terms of sub region and in terms of ideology so it is actually these three aspects that we wanted to bring together so you have the intersectionalities of maya of modi and of azad within which we place present day dalit politics and try to understand the changes that have taken place in the 2000s particularly in the context of the rise of hindu right dr kumar yeah what, what, what is your man, take on uh, this current this state, moment uh, that uh, professor pai was speaking also uh, this uh, long held uh, uh, insight uh, which we have been discussing that when we uh look at the dalit universe uh and not from a top down process but from the bottom up process we found that the entire framing of the question dalit question has been 
particularly in academia, look down from uh, two perspectives, predominantly from the ideological perspective. So when you look at the Dalit question, there is always a normative weight and concern in the analysis. You expect Dalits to belong to a certain Ambedkarite frames who ideally should be preferring for a particular mode of politics and ideology. And therefore, whenever you see divergences are happening from that normative expectation, the analysis tend to move towards some sort of lamenting, some sort of regret, some sort of as, as if there is a democratic statement. So if a Dalit discourse is shifting away from a normative Ambedkarite framework in academic analysis, and that we have failed, we find that more than explanation or more than explaining the mechanism of the shift, there has been a weightage towards marking that shift as a setback to the democratic process. So this is a top-down analysis which looks into the Dalit question through an ideological framework. Now, since we have been engaging with the field, we found that there is also a bottom-up way to look at the Dalit question as to how the Dalits on the ground themselves see their own question and their own discourse. And therein, more than ideology, it is their everyday experience, wherein along with the normative, there is also a sense of pragmatism, pragmatism which was there. So we wanted to capture both the normative as well as the experiential account of everyday life of the Dalit as they, how do they see and make their moves with an active agency not with some agency which can be defined by the author. And that was the prime motivation. We decided to write this book, not just about the summary of what has happened, but also to see what is happening now and how is it expected to unfold in the future. So that was the prime expectation and that was the prime motive to write this book. As I understood it, you merely do not see a turn in the Dalit politics happening now. You are effectively arguing that there are multiple levels and layers of Dalit politics and always perhaps has been. That sounds like a great uh, point of departure to begin with. The book has three parts. The first part deals with uh, the rise shine and I am afraid the decline also of the BSP, Bahujan Samaj Party. The core of the first part or the three chapters on the BSP is really about uh, what can loosely be called the Sarvajan experiment. Um, I can of course introduce what the Sarvajan experiment is but I'd rather like to hear from my teacher. Ma'am, will you take us through uh, what BG BSP was like before the Sarvajan experiment, how the experiment was in a sense rooted in its evolution in political trajectory since the 1990s, and then how it rose to the zenith by 2007 to 2010. And the, the greatest takeaway that, that really came through to me in that those three chapters is also the relatively um, under coverage of the economic agenda of the uh, BSP government between uh, 2007 and 12. Will you take us through the Sarvajan experiment, its strengths and weaknesses and how it in some way you argue represented both uh, the Zenith and also the Nadir of BSP? Well uh, Since Professor its Pai. inception in 1984, the BSP has been through a number of phases. There's a very early phase during the period of decline of the Congress when it's a very radical uh, party which, um, you know, is, uh, which attempts to use things like Tilak Tadu, Tarazu Talwar, 
maro juto in kuchar you know it's and very very anti brahmin very student very rhetorical and that's the period when kanchiram also created his bahujan consciousness and uh, bahujan ideology but somewhere in the middle of the 1990s the bsp realizes that if it is going to continue grassroots mobilization it will take a very long time so it decides to shift from a movement to a party and to attempt to capture power and so from the mid 1990s till the end of the 1990s there are a series of experiments like giving tickets to upper caste giving tickets to the backward caste and so on forming an alliance once with the congress uh, you know pre electoral alliance also forming three governments with the bjp because it believes that you can uh, bring change from above rather than from below the change from above after being in power is a much better option and mayawati once she became the chief minister all those three times she would promptly put into place pro dalit policies which made the bjp very unhappy but by the end of the 1990s to put it briefly they found that in spite of all these experiments coming to power was very difficult because even if all the dalits were to vote for it 22% backward castes are usually the direct oppressors in the countryside the yadavs and so on so the chances of their voting is not much yes some of the most backward castes did vote for it but it realized that it had to change its strategy if it wanted to actually capture power and so in the early 2000s we find that what was called the sarvajan policy was designed what it meant was that the bsp would become like any other party in up it would try and gain the support of also the upper caste that is it would now present itself as a normal state level party it was primarily for the dalits and it would not forget its core constituency but it promised the brahmins particularly that if you help us come to power we will put you in important positions in the cabinet and we will not pursue once we come to power pro dalit policies but we will pursue policies for the development of all castes all sections all groups and also all regions within you now why did the brahmins agree to this i mean why is it that the upper caste suddenly agreed it was because at that point of time both the congress and the bjp if you look at electoral results and otherwise also were in decline the congress of course was in deep decline the bjp post babri masjid had not yet recovered and the brahmins were very unhappy also with atul bihari vajpayee because he had shelved the ram mandir issue Uh, you know he had started what is called a responsible government and so on so they thought why not try and uh, you see during the congress period if you remember in the 50s and 60s paul brass described the you know as a party of extremes the top and the bottom so they thought why not vote for my and i think if you look at the campaign for the 2007 elections which i covered Uh, in an earlier book in great detail great detail yeah you know she uh, is a very good strategist she invited them to brahmin sammelans and you know uh, the conch used to be used uh, you know all sorts of mantras were used the brahmins were made to sit on chairs and they were given great respect and she promised them that when they came to power their interests would be looked after and so in 2007 you have a new mayawati who rides to power in 2007 if you look at her announcement in 2007 june when she first came so you know she asked the upa government at the center for a very large sum of money and she says she's going to look after the interests of everybody that it is not going to be a pro dalit government uh, that there is going to be reduction of fiscal deficit of poverty that purvanchal would benefit agriculture would benefit and so on so so ultimately the upa agrees partly because they need her support and if you look at the mayawati period between 2007 and 
this is something I long wanted to look at because of my belief that she actually did a lot. Though paradoxically she lost. So if you look at our book, GDP grew at 7.28% as against the target of 6.10% under Mayavati between 2007 and 2012. Which is much, much higher than, you know, the double engine Sarkar today or that of the SP earlier. And she pumped over 1 lakh crore into various schemes for the marginalized Dalits as well as the upper caste and such. And she also, uh, you know, invested a great deal in infrastructure. And perhaps uh, most of our readers wouldn't know that uh, she started the first Grand Prix, you know, that racing thing in Noida, which brought in a lot of business and Noida, so on. So yes. she was a, this was a very... Buddha, Buddha, circuit. Buddha circuit. So it was a very different Mayavati which came to power. So <laughs> she actually achieved a lot, and uh, the um, you know she brought a lot of upper castes into the cabinet, and um, so on. And so a great deal was achieved. Just to give one example, she made the largest sewage system for Lucknow, the largest in South Asia as a result of which the Gomti is very clean today. So she did a lot of things. So the question is, why did she lose in 2012? I think uh, about a year after she had started, you see, Dalits had believed that Hamari Sarkar Ai hai. So, you know, they had become equal to the upper class. But there were a number of reasons why this did not happen. One is the very economy of UP, which was in very bad shape. They were in a debt trap by the end of the 1990s. In fact, the World Bank had to rescue them. Second, you see, the upper caste had always been in power. So when it came to contracts, when it came to control of the economy, they continued. Five years in a very short period to make Dalits equal to upper caste. It was just not possible. So I would say that there are many reasons. There is her corruption and so on corruption of her ministers, all that we don't deny. But I think what we argue in the book is that she raised more expectations than could be satisfied. And so Dalits begin to complain that, you know, in spite of her being in power, we don't have roads in our village, we don't have a school, and she is building all these parks and so on, uh, although she claims that it was hardly 2-3% of the budget. So she raised more expectations, more hopes among Dalits than could be fulfilled. And the other change which had taken place was that by the 2000s, you know, <coughs> there was a weakening of identity politics and a great desire for material advancement. Because the BSP had already provided a very large measure of self-respect and dignity. So now they wanted that they should also advance economically. That did not happen. Five years is too short a period to overcome the kind of competitive populism, the decline in the economy which had happened in the 1990s due to identity politics. So the result was that in 2012, there was this perception also among Dalits that the upper caste had benefited more, they had not benefited enough and therefore they, uh, you know, shifted first towards the SP. They didn't shift over to the BJP then. It was only in 2014 that they shifted to the BJP. So, a large number of them voted for the, the SP and the Samajwadi Party comes to power in 2012. So, the Sarvajan policy was an experiment. Uh, I would also say that it came too late. You see, uh, by the time Mayavati began this experiment, Economic aspirations had skyrocketed. There was a post-independence new Dalit generation, a new lower middle and middle class, which wanted to get into, you know, the high paying sectors of the economy, IT, business and so on. And they thought that with UPA at the center and Mayawati in UP, you know, they will reach the sky. But that didn't happen. So there is a great deal of disappointment. Now, initially the media thought 2012 SP has come, next time BSP will come back. But that did not happen because from 2011 onwards there is the mobilization by Narendra Modi, there is the Muzaffar Nagar riots, 
there is the breakdown of the Dalit Muslim Alliance and therefore she could not come back. So I think it was a very uh, interesting experiment but it came too late, it could not satisfy the Dalits and the uh, upper caste left for the BJP and the BSP went into decline. Right. Uh, Dr. Kumar, that really sets it up for you. Uh, the 2012 defeat of the BSP happens. There was still hope, as Professor Pai said, that they could stage a comeback. But it does not really happen. And I, I read you writing that uh, that was probably the best of BSP. And that was a great deal, really. Um, both of you, I suspect, conjecture that the BSP is not ever again going to be the strength, the political party that it had already been in 2007. It's a very bold conjecture. And one of the reasons, one of the core reasons, as Professor Pai also observed, is that the Dalits have been since 2014 steadily gravitating to the BJP. And a great deal of it perhaps has to do with rise in their material aspirations. But what really happened? What really happened between 2014 and 2022 that the BJP really uh, rises to prominence and power in UP and BSP yeah. goes into what seems like a terminal decline? No, you're right about that. Take uh, us through that, uh, that process, uh, those 10 years it was expected yeah. that it's more like the two regional parties, SP and BSP, are alternating power and therefore... Uh, Perhaps uh, once in power, uh, there will be anti-incumbency in 2017, in fact, uh, not only in 2012, but even during the electoral processes of 2017, there was a strong conjecture and perception that perhaps BSP is going to make a comeback, but that didn't happen. Now, the first and foremost reason is that uh, when the two parties started competing with each other, when BJP after 2002 in UP assembly went for a process of decline, electoral decline. You see, uh, from 2002, when BJP loses power, the coalition government, and until uh, 2014 Lok Sabha, BJP's share both in Lok Sabha as well as in assembly is going for a decline. So there is no, you know, tangible fear of BJP as such as was in early 90s to both these regional parties. So they were a bit more complacent with regard to the, you know, factor of BJP. Now, this leads to a different kind of a spin in their strategy. Because besides Dalit, UP also has a significant percentage of the Muslim votes, around 20%. Now, both these parties were under the assumption that they have their own caste-centric or category-centric core vote. So for Samajwadi party, it's the Yadavs and for DSP, it's Jatavs plus a couple of more OBC votes, uh, sorry, the Dalit votes. Now, therefore, they started by the assumption that if they win over the Muslim votes, another significant, that is 20%, that is going to give them a cutting edge vis-a-vis -vis the rival. Now, BJP in their calculation was a third claim. This is one. Now, the cardinal strategic mistake that both SP and BSP committed were twofold. One, they were, they started pitching for being a better votary of the Muslim interests vis-a-vis -vis their rivals at a time when the Hindu-Muslim Hindu relations in UP were not very conducive. Post 2000, before Mujaffar Nagar riots also, you see the everyday relations within the youth segments of Muslim and Hindus were not very conducive. Now at a time, BSP in opposition, while Mayawati initially blamed Muslim when she lost power in 2012, but thereafter, she started with the process of winning over the Muslim, they started claiming it publicly that how BSP has always catered for the Muslim interest better than the Samajwadi party. So much so that since 2016, 
द इलेक्टोरल पिच ऑफ द बहुजन समाज पार्टी वॉज दैट हाउ आउट ऑफ फोर हंड्रेड थ्री सीट्स असेंबली सीट्स बी एस पी इज गोइंग टू फील्ड हंड्रेड मुस्लिम इन द इलेक्शन एंड टू काउंटर दैट समाजवादी पार्टी स्टार्टेड रोपिंग लॉट्स मेनी मुस्लिम लीडर्स क्लेरिक्स लेड बाई आजम खान एंड अदर्स सो द इंप्रेशन दैट मेजोरिटी ऑफ द नॉन जाट ऑफ दलित who had their share in bsp or the lower sections of the obcs who were the core of the bsp or bahujan strategy they got the perception that the bahujan samaj party is now concerned more for either their own caste that is jat of jamar or for the muslims and they have been sent down the drain for samajwadi party already they had this tag of being pro muslims but when they started playing this muslim card over the board many obcs who had been catering to samajwadi party since 1990s they also felt disillusioned this is one now at the same time with the strategy of subaltern hindutva bjp and many rss outfits had already going for a massive outrage among the dalits and the obcs the badri narayan has documented it in two books fascinating hindutva and the recently written republic of india now bjp was not successful earlier but now they are successful because not only they are more customized in their strategy but also a large section of non yadav obcs and non jat of dalits are feeling abandoned and disillusioned because of an aggressive pro muslim pitch which is being consistently peddled both by akhilesh yadav and mayawati herself what happens then that in 2017 election on the in the backdrop of 2014 massive outreach among the dalits and obcs under prime minister modi bjp conducted out of 400 once three seats bjp conducted 201 pichra varg sammelan obc conferences for every two assembly bjp was conducting one pichra work sammel and on the stages it were the local non yadav obcs who were given the participation so it was not just the narrative or the pitch it was actual organizational outreach and their manifestation in a tangible way which went which which sent the masses among the obcs and dalits that at a time when mayawati and akhilesh from the public stages were declaring that how committed they have been and they will be for the muslim interest bjp customized in a customized way silently was working working among the obc center so this is one another factor was also that when both samajwadi party and this is about everyday perception and bsp was in power every day a conflict among the hindus and muslims particularly among the poorer sections and the lower segments the balkan communities is a common phenomenon it can be a matter of law and order it can be a matter of political spin now whenever there used to be say a conflict among a dalit or a muslim or a dalit or, or a lower obc and the muslims during the sp and bsp rule the perception of those dalits or obcs has been that the government or the administration catered to the muslim party because you have very vocal leaders azam khan would be there then there would be other local leaders in purvanchal mukta lots many leaders would be there and therefore they were more organized and the party in power was careful to send a message that they are not going to let muslim go down the trends so therefore it was at around these times when you have leaders like yogi adityanath in purvanchal or so many bjp and rss outfits who would come to side with the lower obcs or the dalits so in everyday experience also the dalits and the obcs a significant section is feeling that they find more relatable to the bjp and hindutva 
and therefore it is the grand sense of this illusionment in everyday experience in their actual experience in power when they find that prime benefit is being given to a particular caste of obc or the dalits and the perception that they are committed more to represent the muslim interest rather than the dalits or the obcs and a very customized and aggressive outreach by the bjp and hindutva outfits among the obcs and dalits that led to a shift of a significant shift of the lower obcs and non jat of dalits towards the hindutva and therefore in both in 2017 uh, 2014 lok sabha and 2017 assembly election you see in terms of their electoral participation their everyday participation the dalits shifted from a ambedkarite social justice centric parties to the hindutva party who until mid 1990s they used to consider as manuvatis and brahmin right um you are arguing um, essentially that there was a structural defect in the mobilizational strategies of the bsp and sp in the sense that they catered primarily to the interests of the majority castes within the obcs and the dalits and that structural defect was identified and indeed exploited very effectively by the bjp by catering to the castes which effectively felt abandoned by the mobilizational strategies and administrative policies of sp and bsp and this uh, sense of alienation is not ideological as i was uh, listening to you but a practical everyday affair uh, you indeed appear to reduce the role of grand ideologies in the shift uh, in dalit politics and positions and their eventual movement to the bjp in substantial numbers and orientation in fact one of the things you argue both of you is that um, the difference between tactical move and ideological move is often overstated in uh, the rounds of conventional analysis of politics about dalits and in general it seemed to me about politics in india i'd like professor pai to weigh in here uh, this theoretical intervention that you make about um, not making too strong or too rigid distinctions between theories um of of uh, dalitness and their tactical and ideological moves seems to be a very powerful intervention you also develop it in the form of what you call fragmentation of the dalit constituency in the politics in uttar pradesh and i suspect that one of the questions i wanted to ask is if that um, that sense of fragmentation in the dalit constituency or the figure of the dalit or dalits in everyday life is applicable also to the rest of india will you please take us through uh, the theoretical point that you make here about uh, strategy tactics and ideology and fragmentation professor pai i think there are two parts to it one is we ask the question why is there simultaneously protest and preference that is when an atrocity takes place there is a post immediate uh, you know protest and protest by very very large numbers and it's not just the uh, smaller caste uh, sub caste but even the jataks and it's also the new organizations like the bhim army and so on but within a few months when there's an election the same set of people vote for the bjp you know if you look at hathras which is a very good example so why do they make why does Absolutely. this happen this is because they will protest if there is injustice but the political and the electoral in their minds and in their thinking is separate the political is very contested it's very dynamic it's full of protest but when it comes to actual election other kinds of issues come for example dalits have always voted for those groups in the in uh, you know that political party 
which can protect them against the dominant caste in the countryside. For example, the Yadavs and the SP representing them. Now, in the 1990s, it was the BSP which protected them. Today, they believe it is only the BJP that can do it. And so, therefore, when it comes to voting, there is, you know, uh, voting for the BJP. Secondly, they also argue that it's the upper caste who do the atrocities and they don't hold the BJP responsible for it. They say even during SP rule, there were atrocities and sometimes even worse. So this is something that has been happening across the board. And of course, then they are attracted by, you know, um, the welfareism of the BJP itself, by, of the BJP. Also, if you look at the BSP, in recent years, apart from very, very symbolic condemnation, the BSP and particularly Mayawati that doesn't step out when these protests take place to try and protect them. It is largely Chandrasekhar Azad and the Bhim Army and similar such ones which do it. So therefore in their minds there is both, uh, you know, support as well, I mean protest as well as support for the BJP as such. The second question which follows from this is, is this support really tactical, temporary, instrumental or does it really reflect a kind of an ideological conversion to the Hindutva of the BJP, particularly with the smaller subcaste that Now it is here that we argue that we should not see the two as a binary. You see, in one election Dalits may vote for the BJP. Because they are attracted by material incentives, the BSP is in decline, there is no point in it, voting for it. But if this voting continues over a number of elections, as for example in the case of the Balmikis, whom we look at more closely in the book, then it can be seen as becoming ideological. You see, it then becomes something that is done over a long period of time and here you know the BJP's methods of attraction like you know um, religiosity uh, you know making them part of the larger Hindu identity and so on is important. Here I must make two points. One is that you know in the, in the mid 1990s when the BSP shifted from a movement from a party to uh, sorry from a movement to a party it stopped you know, then mobilizing downwards. The smaller subcasts in Purvanchal, you know, the Musahars, the Pasis and the Malas and so on. It was it concentrated more on the question of power. So for a long period of time, these subcasts have felt neglected and have felt that the BSP is a jatter party and nobody asked for it. The second is that you know, uh, the, you know, the, the ideological conversion is, I mean, if you look at it, there's been a long period of Hinduization from the 19th century onwards. Post-independence also it continued, but today it's a very open political project which then impacts on the political process. So, you see, um, you know, attracting the uh, smaller subcasts looking at their past heroes, their histories, their culture, giving importance to them has become very important. So therefore, they are attracted. Now, reversals are possible. Tomorrow the BSP comes up again. But what we argue is that reversals do not seem likely in the future. Because the process of Hinduization has run very deep. You know, the, what one could call the fascination of being Hindu has become very important. I mean, this is true across all castes. You look at the upper caste, you look at the backward caste, you look at the Dalits. So this whole question of Hinduization, this whole question of being attracted to the larger Hindu identity is very important. And with the BSP in decline, we feel that it's not really tactical but it is increasingly becoming ideological. That may not be true for the Jatavs, although some argue that in the 20, uh, 20 elections that took place, even Jatavs voted for the BJP. But a large number of them remained for the 
with the PSP. So there is a three-way kind of division. Respect is there for Benji. Azad is called when there are atrocities. I, but vote is for Vijay. So you see, there is this whole thing, a very complex and layered interplay which is happening on the ground and which is usually missed if you look at it purely from the point of view of Ambedkarite Dalits or who is an authentic Dalit and who is not an authentic. Thank you so much, ma'am. You you ended with what can loosely be called the three phases of the Dalits, really. An electoral phase, a protest phase, and an ideological phase. And you argue that all of them can really exist side by side, not necessarily converging into one overarching Dalit I, face. Um, I Dr. Kumar, add one more thing. please, please, ma'am, go ahead. The social deepening of democracy and the rise of Hindutva, very paradoxically, are happening simultaneously. It's a very paradoxical situation. Dalits have become more confident. They are voting for whoever they want. They are making their own choices. And so there is a certain social deepening of democracy which you cannot deny. And yet, at the same time, you have the rise of Hindutva. I think that is the paradox that I hope our book has in a way conveyed. It, it, it actually does very eloquently, which is where I was about to ask Dr. Kumar about what he finds on the ground. Um, how is this paradox really playing out on the ground? In fact, um, uh, you write about this upwardly mobile aspiring Dalit student, a girl, uh, in the Sarvajan chapter I read that, who is not really very happy with the politics of identity. But on the whole, the Jatavs are. The Dalits have multiple voices. Um, that's very clear from the book. And indeed, they appear like any other political constituency, which I think is very refreshing about the book. The Dalits aren't really this figure who must look like, you know, a rebel for all times to come until the caste system is annihilated. So um, how do you really humanize the Dalits? Where do you find these, you know, multiple faces of the Dalits in UP? You've conducted extensive field works in recent years. I'd like you to, to show us yeah. this human uh, face really of first, the Dalits uh, uh, in some more detail. Observations and observations and then give you some anecdotes so that it becomes uh, clearer. One, uh, what we observed on the ground. It's just that Dalits are as normal a category as any caste of community. They are not exotic self, you know, wherein the outsider should always be fascinated that you find something shocking, something uh, 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 paranormal, something very exotic. And therefore, once the community acquires a sense of confidence, because of the deepening of democracy, they also start aspiring in as normal a way as any other caste or community, say Brahmins or Yadavs or any caste community. And therefore, this book is an attempt to offer a normal self of the Dalit away from a fascination with presenting the Dalit, framing the Dalit question. As an exotic self. This is one. Two, <clears throat> now that they have acquired, there is a Dalit middle class, there is a Dalit millennial, there is a Dalit community which is too deep into social media. So there is an information overflow both ways. And when there is a rising aspiration, so like any other caste or community, and this is very commonsensical, we have not said something uh, out of the blue. We have just said that what we observed on the ground, that a Dalit, confident Dalit, like any caste or community, when it is aspirational, is not willing to accept one party or one leader as the authentic party or the authentic leader. They all are committed to a core, that is the Ambedkarite commitment, respect for Kashiram, respect for Dalit icons, but 
what they are, where their departure is, that why should you be the leader rather than me? When I also have the same capability and aspiration. And there I bring, if you read the book, the character of Nepal. And this is the first state of fragmentation. You know, intra jat of Chamar. Within Jato and Chamar, the, right. what, what was the complaint of Nepal Singh in Saharan? And our interview with Nepal Singh started around the same time when the Saharanpur riot had happened. Bhim Army came into prominence and Azad emerged as an icon. Professor Pai was leading uh, an ICSSR led study and I was doing the field work in Saharanpur. I happened to be in Saharanpur that time. And it was around that time when we first met Nepal Singh and, there have, and thereafter have been continuing interviewing in a longitudinal way. Now Nepal Singh started as a very humble Dalit. Came to Saharanpur, settled in Jatav Nagar without uh, any support, settled with some relatives and today he is the richest man in Jatav Nagar. Radicalized in Ambedkarite ideology by none other than Manyavar Kashiram himself. But his problem was that because of my skill and hard work, when I acquired wealth, I started donating more for the Ambedkar Jayanti and BSP. But there was a nexus that there would be a local BSP leader. There would be a zonal BSP leader. And they would not recognize his commitment and his contributions. And that was a mark of disrespect. That was a denial to his achievement. You know, that was a mark of sabotaging his mode of showing his commitment for the Ambedkarite ideology. That why should someone because of party and leadership proximity within Jatav community, within BSP fold, be a permanent leader when he has shown that he has better capability, he gives more employment to the fellow Jatavs. He has better connectivity to the market, he gets more works done when they are in trouble, he is the one who is always catering the financial help. But when it comes to a leadership, this is a static. So the ground is moving, the party's position is more static, less static. <coughs> and therefore, because of this internal rift, some incidents happen between the local BSP leader and Nepal Singh. And already the BSP, BJP leaders were in touch with him. So one fine day, he decides to shift to BJP and join BJP. Now there is a rift. Now his shift is not just an individual aspiration. It is a power play. It is a power play which fractures and split Ambedkarite claims wide open. When you pose, I pose the question that BJP is a Brahmanical party. That is the perception. That is the perception. And there have been recent incidents when in the, some of the BJP leaders called Mayavati names and that was an insult. Nepal Singh argued that fine, these are the instances happening in society and happen in BJP but the party took action, expelled the leader. But someone from Samajwadi party, Azam Khan, insulted Ambedkar by saying that the pointed finger of Ambedkar is that capture all the land that you could see in a rally. Did Mayavati or Bahujan Samajwati party went for protest? Is Mayavati bigger than Ambedkar? Her insult bigger than the insult of... So you see it's also a power move. And therefore you have this fragmentation which is which starts from a very confident middle class fragmentation which we see in other castes also. So Dalits are behaving in a normal way, like others. Ideology, tacticality are just the means. And these are the markers that there is a deepening of democracy. Because you have a confident Dalit self who is not afraid that party A is the quintessential vanguard of their interest. They are confident to bargain and acquire leverage instrumentally, tactically or ideologically and thereby they move forward. This is what. Besides intra jatav intra jatav chamar uh, fragments, another set of fragments is the intra-regional within UP. 
एंड इन हिंदी इट्स कॉल आंचलिक आंचलिक और आंचलिकता सो सब रीजनल नेस विच हैज एमर्स नाउ यू हैव अ कॉन्फिडेंट दलित सेल्फ दे आर विलिंग टू पोज एवरी फैक्टर दैट हेल्प देम एस्टैब्लिश देयर क्रेडेंशियल एज अ बेटर वोटरी ऑफ द दलित इंटरेस्ट विजा वी द राइवल्स तो श्रवण कुमार निराला फ्रॉम पूर्वांचल ईस्टर्न यूपी डजम एन ए काम अबाउट लेबलिंग एंटायर यू वेस्टर्न यूपी दलित माइंड सेट एज कैलकुलेटिव सेल्फिश एंड सेल्फ सर्विस दैट हिंद पश्चिमी उत्तर प्रदेश के जो दलित होते हैं और वो हमेशा से बिकॉज ही हैज बीन अ वेटरन विद इन द बी एस पी ड्यूरिंग मायावतीज डेज अंटिल रिसेंटली बिफोर ही पार्टेड वेज दैट पश्चिमी उत्तर प्रदेश का दलित हमेशा स्वार्थ की राजनीति अपने फायदे की बात है और पूर्वांचल का दलित इमोशनल होता है भावनात्मक होता है दैट द दलित ऑफ द वेस्टर्न यूपी आर ऑलवेज सेल्फ सर्विंग वाइल द ईस्टर्न यूपी दलित इज ऑलवेज कमिटेड willing to give and sacrifice so you also see that this emergence of a confident dalit is not anxious about pretending to have a pan indian or pan regional consolidation and solidarity they are willing to use every trick and tactics and that is something which every caste and community leaders have been doing and third factor is besides if you see a uh, uh, sub regional intra regional intra jatav chamar is also within the lit discourse the jatav chamars versus the rest the smaller sub now their experience is clear that the term dalit is a normative move but in everyday life it doesn't give a symmetrical representation to all the dalit sub castes and that is not just a perception that is an experience even during the bsp rule be it pasis be it valmikis be it khatiks who after the jat of chamar have a significant percentage of votes they felt <coughs> left behind when bsp came into power on its own and when you make the charge that there may be some discrepancy a symmetry in bsp's approach but yet it is a dalit friendly party so any day any day it is way better than a non dalit party like say sp or bjp their response is simple that yes there are atrocities on the dalits but that is a societal problem that is not a bjp problem so they do not make perception based on the number of incidents and the party which is in power they have a clear demarcation that the atrocities on dalits is a societal problem and that has been happening and on that count they do not see a bjp ruled phase being worse than samajwadi party ruled phase in fact majority of dalits still feel that ideologically bjp may be contested within the dalits but compared to samajwadi party it is a better claim the worst experience of the dalits has been under samajwadi party rule and this is also accepted by pro bsp or pro bjp party so this is the interplay of this multiple layers of fragmentation which is a mark and this is something we celebrate it it it, it heralds or it signifies the arrival of a confident dalits who are willing to experiment any party any platform any ideology any tacticality as normally as the upper caste or intermediary caste centric middle classes have been doing fragmentation is a sign of democratic dip not a crisis this is the right. crux of our argument as as someone who has um, done some work on um, caste politics in bengal although much much earlier um i'm i'm pretty happy that uh, <clears throat> the contemporary political scientists and analysts are coming to a conclusion like this i mean caste in bengal has always been the elephant in the room uh, but some of us um did argue along similar lines that the dalit in bengal have always been uh, tactically quite agile and this may or may not have something to do with a certain kind of gentrification 
earlier than to other parts of India. This point uh, makes me very happy is coming through all over India now. The last question to both of you really, do you foresee that the Dalit as a political subject is now going to speak more and more in multiple voices? Because you also refer, I noticed, to the study that in states where there's been a history of sustained movement for the Dalit cause uh, results into the Dalits never quite moving to the BJP, although they vote for different parties, and the states where relatively there's a smaller, shorter history of sustained Dalit movement, there's a greater tendency to move towards the BJP. Given this reality of what some of us see in, in states like Bengal, and the history of sustained Dalit movements, for instance, in the South. You point that out very clearly, looking at Amit Ahuja's work, for instance. Um, where do you foresee the Dalit in North India, or as a whole in India, going in the short and medium term election? National election is within a year. So a little bit of prognostication, prediction ahead on a lighter vein. Professor Pai first, and then Dr. Kumar. Well, I'll make some observations before I come to 24. One is that you refer to Amit Ahuja's work, which is very interesting. I think uh, there is, if you contrast Uttar Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, for example. In Uttar Pradesh, during the colonial period, compared to Tamil Nadu, there were no large-scale movements of the Dalits. It's only in the late colonial period that you have the scheduled caste federation. In fact, Ambedkar visited Agra as late as 1936. So, uh, what I've argued elsewhere is that you have late development of Dalit consciousness. Whereas in Tamil Nadu, the story is very, very different. We all know that, you know, both backward caste as well, uh, I mean, non brahmin as well as Dalit movements started fairly early and had a great impact in the colonial period and that continued. So the result is that, you know, Dalits today do not allow the BJP to enter into Tamil Nadu and therefore they have taken a very different trajectory. I think in UP a second reason why uh, it's so easy for them to move into other parties is that Bhavadhan consciousness as Kanchiram enunciated it, was largely an elite and not a mass phenomena as they put it in the book. It's largely the Jatav Chamars, the better off, the slightly educated people who really took to it and who were united by it. And as we know, Mayavati also comes from the same subclass. So there is a division between the two, which historically is there for a long period of time. So the chances of the subcaste, the smaller subcaste, the non jatavs you know, voting for the BJP are quite strong in the, in the coming 2024 elections. And uh, it, I think a section of the jatavs would continue to remain with the BJP. The only scenario in which, you know, the scheduled caste, the smaller subcaste may not vote in very large numbers for the BJP would be a general movement against the BJP because of unemployment, because of inflation. You know, economists tell you when the water rises beyond a certain point, people do not put up any longer with economic distress. Unless that happens, I would think that the smaller subcast would still continue to vote for the BJP. Uh, what is the future then as of the BSP? I think <laughs> the BSP will become like the Dalit Panthers in Maharashtra. You know, they have recently celebrated their 50th anniversary. They do not have any strong party or organization today. But their ideology still influences Dalits. So similarly, the BSP <coughs> may not disappear like the RPI, the Republican Party of India earlier. It will continue to have an influence in the uh, on the lives and the thinking of Dalits 
that is Ambedkarite ideology or Ambedkarism or Ambedkarization will not totally disappear. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, that ideology will continue as such. But the chances of the BSP recovery coming back to its heyday seem very limited, partly also because of the existence of a strong majoritarian Hindu party, which, you know, takes their votes but doesn't really help them and which does not help them to come up. You can see that in UP as well. So I would think that the future of the BSP is one of fragmentation. There will be no all in all UP party. There will be groups in various parts, but one major legacy of the BSP would be the continuation of Dalit assertion on the ground. That will be there. What use people like, like Chandrasekhar Azad or Shavan Kumar Nirala make of it in the long run, that we will have to Dr. Do. Kumar. Yeah, very briefly adding to that. Uh, there are two <coughs> set of uh, factors who are the movers and doers. I mean, in future, now and in future, of the Dalit discourse. One is the Dalit millennials, you know, the Dalit youths. If you see, be it uh, Chandrasekhar Ajad or Shravan Kumar Nirala or so many, Jignesh Mewani, for example, in uh, uh, Gujarat, etc. The prime uh, forces of the Dalit pitch across the ideological spectrum is coming from relatively younger generation. This is one. Two, there is a complete discrepancy and divergence between the Dalit elites who are educated in universities, colleges, and prefer to look at the ground more from the ideological frame, who still have a quest for an authentic And the disc between them and the gap between the Dalit masses who in their everyday experience do not see ideological realm more in a exotic manner. To them it's not. So what will happen in 2024? You will find more university and college educated Ambedkarite Dalit youths, millennials who prefer ideology over experience will make anti-BJP pitch because they have this authentic Ambedkarite conviction. On the ground, the masses, they may have mixed experience, but over in the final analysis, they take a very pragmatic view. And therefore, BJP's outreach gives them some ideological input also. So ideological and experiential account of the masses will move more towards BJP as of now. So while the articulated Dalits will pitch more anti-BJP voices, the inference that we draw is that in electoral preferences, BJP is still, at least in a state like UP, should be the prime beneficiary of their votes. So that is about the future. Lovely. Um, <clears throat> indeed, the book talks about, as Professor Pai observed, uh, the paradox of protest and preference at the same time. Thank you so much for your time. I would not even try to summarize this long and engaged discussion, but I did understand and I'd like our listeners to understand that the political category of Dalits, as Professor Pai and Dr. Kumar argue in the UP, as elsewhere in India, is undergoing a deepening um, and also a division at the same time. The deepening happens uh, on account of globalization, on account of structural limitations of Dalit parties like the BSP, and also political innovations of parties like the BJP, which exploits those structural limitations. But at the same time, they also talk about the rising material aspirations of the Dalit and its segmented constituencies, even within the Dalit categories in UP and elsewhere, there is an educated Dalit. And then there is the Dalit majority looking for material benefits and taking pragmatic uh, decisions. 
So the Dalit in Indian politics, very clear from the book, emerges as a category which thinks for himself or herself, which makes conscious political choices, and which is not really wedded to a timeless ideological discourse as the perpetual rebel. We look forward to how the category of Dalit evolves in um, the short and medium term, Till then, I thank both of you profusely from the core of my heart for your time and insights. And I need to extract another promise that you'll be here again to talk about everyday communalisms at some point in future. Thank you so much, Professor Pai. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.